My name is Satsvarupa Das Goswami. I'm 74 years old. I'm one of Prabhupada's first disciples. I joined him in 1966 at his storefront temple, Matchless Gifts, 26 Second Avenue. I was very attracted to Prabhupada. We called him Swamiji in those days. The first question I asked him from the audience was, is misery eternal? I had read in a book of letters by the painter Vincent van Gogh to his brother Theo that he said, misery is eternal. So I wanted to know what the Swami thought. Prabhupada said, yes, misery is eternal. You can go into the hospital for a broken arm and they'll heal it, but when you get out, you may break your leg. So there's always some misery in the world. But, he said, there is another world there is no anxiety, that's the spiritual world. So that was very enlightening for me, to relieve me from that dismal view of Van Gogh. The second question I asked him was in private in his room. I asked him, is there a level of Krishna consciousness you can come to from which you won't fall down. And he answered with just one word, he said, yes. But he said it with such conviction that I was not only intellectually convinced, but emotionally and psychologically. And I was able to give up all my sinful activities Actually, from the first time I went into the storefront on that first night that I chanted with him, I stopped my sinful activities of smoking marijuana and illicit sex, and I never did them again. That's pretty miraculous that just one exposure to him took out those ingrained addictions. I had a job at the time. I was working for the Welfare Department of New York City as a caseworker. I would go into people's homes and interview them to see if they were eligible for welfare and then take care of their needs. So I was able to donate my money to the temple. I had $400 savings in the bank. I was going to use it to take a vacation and go to Canada and write. I was a writer already before I met him by vocation. It was my religion. I wrote stories and novels. And I had just had something published in an underground magazine. So I decided to give Prabhupada all my money. I took it out of the bank. He had no money. He just got by from month to month on donations, whatever people gave him. You just depended on Krishna to pay the rent. So my donation was very significant at that time, $400. And he accepted it with a big smile. I gave it to him alone in his room. And then I went and I sat down 
and looked at him, and between the time that he smiled at me and the time I sat down and looked at him, his face changed. And he looked at me very gravely and seriously, almost with displeasure. As if he broke my pride that being a big benefactor and donor and was saying, now when are you going to surrender to Krishna? I was sobered. He gave lectures on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights at 7 o'clock. He would lead kirtan and then give a lecture. I just heard a tape from 1966. They're my favorite lectures recorded by him. And he said, in this room, meaning the temple room, we have just practiced Shravanam Kirtanam. I chanted and you heard then you chanted and I heard. These are the two first principles and the nine principles of practicing Krishna consciousness, hearing and chanting. So, we didn't know our good fortune to be hearing from the lips of a pure devotee Rupa Goswami says, we wander through this material world and somehow by the grace of Guru and Krishna, we meet a bona fide spiritual master and he plants the seed of devotional service in our heart. So by Prabhupada's potent kirtans, we were in ecstasy there were about 12 devotees who gathered and became his disciples. And most of us had taken LSD, the hallucinatory drug. And so we knew what it was to be high. And so we were thinking of the chanting in terms of a high. And we'd say to each other after the kirtan, wow, did you get high? I really got high that time. Hayagriva asked Prabhupada if taking LSD could help your spiritual life. Prabhupada said, your spiritual life is already here. You don't have to take any chemical to induce it. Just chant Hare Krishna. So we did, and we made a pamphlet, Stay High Forever. Then he gave his lecture for about half an hour or 45 minutes, and then another kirtan that he would lead. He was so strong he played on a one-headed bongo drum. We didn't have any madranga. But he played on it like a madranga beats. It was the summertime and Prabhupada didn't wear a kurta, he just wore his sannyas top piece and his dhoti. And he had a pair of white plastic shoes that he brought with him from India. He would come down the stairs, cross the courtyard in those shoes, and step out of them as he got into the temple room. That was my best time in Krishna consciousness. 
being with him in those early days. We were like a family. And when in January he said that he was going to move to San Francisco to open a second temple, we were shocked. We thought that Krishna consciousness would always stay in New York City in one temple. We didn't know his vision. Sometimes he joked with us and said, Oh, Brahmananda, you will open a temple in Russia? But we didn't know that he was serious about such things. So he left us and went to San Francisco. And we felt very sad. But then he wrote us a letter back and said, I understand you are feeling my absence. You should know that the spiritual master is present and his instructions are his vani. And the personal presence is not as important as the instructions. You are serving me in separation. He addressed the letter not to one person, but to all of us. And that letter gave us such great hope. We thought, oh, we're serving Swamiji in separation. We have something the devotees in San Francisco don't even have. But he was only gone three months and then he came back. And we were happy again. I did typing for him. He had stacks of manuscripts of the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita. I had a manual typewriter in my apartment and I typed up his manuscripts which were already typewritten but which Hayagriva edited and I typed them into clean copies. I got my education in Krishna consciousness in that way. When Prabhupada went to San Francisco the first time, he started using the dictaphone. He started using it in New York, actually. Gargamuni brought it for him. So he, he used to type himself. He had a tin trunk, and he put his typewriter on the trunk and typed but Gargamuni got him this dictaphone where he made tapes. And this revolutionized his writing system. So when he got to San Francisco, he interrupted his writing of Srimad Bhagavatam to write another book, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya. And he sent it to me. And I was the only typist of that book. I would type it early in the morning before going to work. And it was ecstasy, an intimate connection with him, hearing him on the earphones. I also typed the Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, third canto, fourth canto. And then he wanted to start the Krishna book. And I typed that too.
I would hear the Krishna stories and give them in my lectures to the devotees. And they would hear for the first time about Krishna killing Putana, Krishna killing Agasura, and all of Krishna's childhood activities. When Prabhupada left for San Francisco, I moved to Boston by myself and opened the temple. Brahmananda, the temple president of New York, sent two devotees up to join me and with three of us we ran the storefront temple in Boston. We lectured at the universities and held Sunday feasts. Not many people came at first but gradually more came. On Sundays we would go to the park and chant. I wrote Prabhupada letters about twice a week and he wrote me back twice a week. I received many, many letters from him. In the collection of letters from Srila Prabhupada, he wrote the most letters to Brahmananda. And the second letters most was to me. I had philosophical questions for him and practical questions and he would write me back regularly. Those questions guided my, those letters guided my life. In New York City, Prabhupada had a stroke and he had to go into the hospital. When he came out, he still wasn't feeling good. And he decided to go back to India. He said, maybe I will die in Vrindavan. We were all very sad to see him go. We thought, how could we last without him? We're just neophytes. But he wrote us letters from Vrindavan. He said, Vrindavan is inspiration only. Our real movement is worldwide. I will return to you. I am starting to feel better. I have typed this letter myself. And then after six months, he did come back. He went to San Francisco first. And then he started opening many temples. In America and eventually in England and Europe. Prabhupada formed the GBC to help him manage affairs. In 1970, and he appointed me as one of the 12 members of the GBC with a certain zone of temples in the United States. 
the southern part of the United States. But I still was temple president of Boston. Then Prabhupada went back to India with a group of devotees and traveled around. I wanted to go with him, but he wrote me a letter and said, you cannot leave Boston. You have to stay there. So I did my service in separation while he would traveled in India with the devotees. I first went to India in 1973 and stayed with Prabhupada for a month. Then in 1974, I was traveling sannyasi with a group of brahmacharis and we were doing Sankirtan in Texas. And I got a phone call from the temple president and manager of Los Angeles, Karandar. And he said that Prabhupada wanted me to come and join him as his permanent personal servant because his servant, Kirti Raj Prabhu, had just gotten married. So right away I left my brahmachari party in Texas and I flew to Los Angeles and I joined Prabhupada, became his personal servant and secretary. And I had to learn how to cook for him, which was hard because I didn't know how to cook. But I learned, and he tolerated my cooking until finally I began to cook well. I learned how to make his favorite preparation, shock. He left Los Angeles and we traveled to Honolulu, to Tokyo, Japan, and then back to India. I stayed with Prabhupada as his servant for six months. And then I got restless. I wanted to preach again with the party of brahmacharis and not just be his servant. It's very intense being the intimate servant of the spiritual master. So he let me go when he was in his room and on a European tour, he was talking about his desire to see his books put in libraries all over the United States. And he wanted a party formed. And I spoke up and I said, I can do it. And he said, then do it. And he gave me my transfer with those words. So when we came back to America, I transferred from his personal secretary to being in charge of a group of brahmacharis 
who represented themselves as BBT representatives. And we traveled to all the colleges in the United States in vans. And we sold standing orders of his books. Prabhupada loved that party. When the professors wrote letters approving his books, he got great pleasure out of that. And he saved the letters and published the letters. They would say, Swami Bhaktivedanta's Srimad Bhagavatam is an excellent devotional study of this great literature. We are fortunate to have this presentation for our library. He was very happy with those letters. Then Prabhupada got ill in 1977. And he went to Vrindavan to spend his last days. I visited him three times during that year. And it was very shocking to see him he had lost so much weight, but he was still dignified and beautiful. But he said, these are my last days. GBC formed a committee and we asked Prabhupada some questions about how things would go on after his disappearance. We asked him how there would be initiations. And he said, I will choose some of you and you will become regular gurus and you will initiate after my disappearance. Then we asked him if we would continue to publish books after he stopped writing. He said, yes, if there are qualified people in Sanskrit, they can publish the Vaishnav literatures. And other technical questions about protecting the properties. He assigned trustees to the properties. And on November 14th, 1977, at 7.20 p.m., while all the devotees were chanting at his bedside, he passed away. Before his passing away, the BBT suggested in a letter that someone should write a biography of Prabhupada. And he, when it came, the suggestion came to him, he said that I should do it. So at the GBC meeting, the GBC commissioned me to write the book. And Kushikrata supplied a list of names to give the book, Sanskrit names, and I chose Srila Prabhupada Lilamrita. And I worked with a group of my disciples and God brothers who went around and collected interviews with people who knew Prabhupada. And we did research from his lectures about him talking about his early days. And I had enough material to write a book. I started with the second volume of his life in New York City, because that was the days I knew best. 
and had the most research on I called it planting the seed. The BBT published 5,000 copies and it was very well received. I had an introduction from Professor Hopkins. Then I wrote the first volume which covered all of Prabhupada's life in India before he came to America. I called that volume A Lifetime in Preparation. Gradually, over five years, I wrote six volumes, and then I wrote another volume called Prabhupada Lila. So there were seven volumes to the biography. A one volume, they wanted a one volume book to distribute on book distribution to the public. So my disciple Baladeva Bijabhusana condensed the seven volumes down into one volume. And that book has become the second most distributed book in ISKCON after the Bhagavad Gita as it is. It's a very good book and it has made many people into devotees of Krishna consciousness. But it's a shame that if that's the only biography that they read because the full biography contains all the sweetness and it's published now in two volumes by the North European BBT in English and some languages have this translated the whole Prabhupada Lidamrita, but not many languages. I don't think it's translated in Russian and Ukrainian languages. But that should be done. In 1978, at the GBC meeting, the GBC chose 11 persons to initiate on Prabhupada's behalf. They were the persons that Prabhupada named to initiate on his behalf while he was still alive, but unable to initiate because of illness. So I began taking disciples In the beginning, we made some mistakes. We accepted worship on too high a level. And didn't allow our God brothers to initiate. But there was a reform movement in 1986 and things were changed and more devotees were allowed to initiate and the use of exclusive Vyasa sons for gurus was disbanded. Around this time I broke down in my health and started getting migraine headaches. I would get a piercing pain behind my right eye and the headaches would last for 24 hours and they would come for several days at a time. It got so bad I couldn't tolerate attending the GBC meetings and coinciding with the time that the gurus had their reform and was opened up to many gurus. 
I resigned because of health from the GBC. But I had a second reason. I also thought that since the GBC had been criticized for committing mistakes, I ought to resign. And then I became a traveling sannyasi in a van and I went to European countries and lectured, but I still had this handicap of the migraine headaches. They lasted for 20 years. I started curtailing my travels and started taking retreats in rented houses where I would write. I started publishing books like Japa Reform Notebook, 26 Qualities of a Devotee, Vaishnava Behavior, Prabhupada Nectar. And these books were published by our press, Gita Nagari Press. Prabhupada encouraged me throughout his personal presence to do writing. He encouraged me to read his books. I once asked him if it was all right to read three hours a day in his books. I was reading that much and I thought maybe he would say that's not good, that's being a Babaji, you should be more active, preacher. But he wrote me back and said, yes, whenever you get time, read my books or else how will you preach? You should always read my books. So I was encouraged and I took to a deep study of his books. And from that, I wrote my own books. I didn't imitate Prabhupada, I wrote in my own voice as a person who had come to Krishna consciousness. With a Western mindset, I finally settled in the country of Ireland and wrote a series of books called Every Day Just Write. It was a journal. And I started to paint. I'm a primitive painter, what they call a naive artist, a person who's not trained in painting, but who paints sincerely. There's a whole school of painting of artists like that. Some great artists have painted out of that school, including a French artist called Jean Dubuffet, who used the phrase art brute, A-R-T-E-B-R-U-T-E. -E. And he said that painting shouldn't be polished, it should be like children's art. He said the best artists were the insane people. So I painted a great deal in Ireland and I did wood sculptures too. I gradually had a one-man show in Govinda's gallery in Washington, D.C. And it got a good review in the Washington Post. 
by the art critic With the help of a disciple, doctor, and a counselor, I finally managed to subdue my migraine headaches. That was a gradual process of using allopathic medicine. Now, I'm 74 years old and I'm headache free. I don't have to take any medicine, but I'm fragile and I don't travel. When I travel, I get too much stress and I get headaches again. So my disciple Sachi Sutta has given me a house in upstate New York in a town called Stuyvesant Falls and I live in an ashram with Gorni Thai deities and my Radha Govinda deities and with two assistants, Baladev and Narayan Kabacha. We're trying to get more help. We're understaffed. I receive many visitors. And I write, I've started writing a website on the internet. Every day I post, it's called sdgonline.org. I post an excerpt from the Rasa Shastras. Now I'm posting excerpts from Rupa Goswami's Stavamala poems, four verses a day. And then I post a japa report on my japa of that morning, how it went. And then I post some drawings that I made of Sankirtan devotees and write a stanza about the importance of Harinam. And then I write some stanzas in this daily poem on the website of what I call Little Life. It's excerpts from the Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita that are read to me at mealtimes, his thoughts and activities that go on in our ashram, and his reports of visitors that we receive. And then finally I write a stanza of meditation on my deities, Radha Govinda, this is the best way for people to keep in touch with me, to look at this website every day, sdgonline.org. In recent years, I've started writing my autobiography. I call it the story of my life. I published one volume a couple of years ago. It's been translated into Russian, I heard. I mixed memories of my pre-Krishna conscious life with my career in ISKCON and took writing assignments from a book called The Practice of Writing Memoir which provokes questions from my pre-Krishna conscious life and my life in ISKCON. Then I wrote a second volume in which I printed excerpts from the books I had written and made comments on them from the present perspective. At this rate, I can go on writing volumes of my story of my life. 
in many volumes because I've written over 150 books. I can print excerpts from them and make comments on them from the present viewpoint. So I'm what you call a Chetra Sanyas, like Gadadhar Pandit, who took the vow not to leave Jagannath Puri. I'm staying in one place and writing books and writing on my website and receiving visitors. I feel very much like I'm on the front lines of Krishna consciousness in this way without having to travel and give lectures. I'm very happy with my two disciples in Russia and with their assistance Ishana and her husband Alexei managed to get my books translated by other devotees and then they take them to the festivals in Ukraine and Russia and distribute the books and they distribute 4,000 books in a year. So I have a reading following in Russia, though I won't go there. We can be together through my books. Yeah, that's about all I want to say.